Most people have never heard of Deborah Sampson, and yet she was one of the earliest women to be enlisted with an army of the United States. But she would accomplish this in the only way a woman could in the 18th century, by living as a man. Deborah was born on the 17th of December in 1760 in the house her grandparents had built in Plimpton, Massachusetts. She was descended from some of the Mayflower passengers, including Henry Sampson through her father Jonathan Sampson and through her mother Deborah Bradford, William Bradford, who had come from West Yorkshire in England and became the second governor of Plymouth Colony. She also wasn't an only child, being the middle child with six siblings. However, at some point, her father abandoned the family. While in later years, Deborah would tell her own children that her father had died in a shipwreck, evidence actually shows he ran off and moved to Maine in 1766, where he took up a common-law wife and had two more children. It gets murkier still, as in 1770, a man named Jonathan Sampson was indicted for murder in Maine, but as the case never reached court, there's no way of knowing if it was indeed Deborah's father or simply someone with the same name, which was entirely possible. So while no doubt Deborah would have had plenty of other family members around her in the form of grandparents, aunts and uncles and cousins, she still would have watched her mother try to take on the role of both mother and father while still very young. Unfortunately, Deborah's mother wasn't able to provide for her children after this point and she placed them with various relatives. When her mother died a few years later, Deborah was then sent to live with a reverend's widow named Mary Prince Thatcher. Mary was an elderly lady and this would be an important stop on Deborah's journey through life. Now in her 80s, it's likely Mary would have struggled to read the Bible and so she might have asked Deborah to read passages to her. At that point, devoid of education, this was probably where Deborah learned to read. Although her later life would show she always had a thirst for learning. This would be built upon in 1770 when Deborah was around 10 years old. Mary died in the same year and so her ward was sent to live with the family of Jeremiah Thomas in Middleborough, Massachusetts. But she wouldn't be able to have a free ride here and despite only being about 10 years old, Deborah worked as an indentured servant in order to pay for her keep. However, she was well treated but her extremely minimal education stopped altogether, as Mr. Thomas didn't think women needed to earn an education, a widely held view at the time. Deborah found a way around this, secretly gleaning information from the schoolwork of Thomas's own sons. They would share the schoolwork they brought home with them, and by the time Deborah was 18 years old and left the Thomas household, she had learned enough to be a school teacher over the summers of 1779 and 1780. But Deborah appears to have been a highly skilled individual, and during the winters she instead worked as a weaver. She also worked in taverns and again as a servant for various local families, usually boarding with them. This would have been typical for a young woman in Deborah's position, and it would have been a hard life. But she also had an entrepreneurial spirit and she was a natural when it came to woodworking and mechanics. She wove baskets, made milking stools and winter sledges out of wood, spools to hold thread, weather vanes, weaving tools and even pie crimpers, which she would sell by going door to door with them and flogging to the housewives within. In short, Deborah was a highly motivated individual who didn't let anything get in her way, not poverty, not being an orphan, or even a piecemeal education. Sampson must also have been a striking person in her appearance. Most men of her day were around 5 foot 5 inches, but Deborah clocked in at around 5 foot 7 to 8 inches, and her later biographer Herman Mann made the delicate remark, her waist might displease a coquette. 
suggesting she was not slim. Deborah was therefore tall and broad, and her features were noted by others in later years as being somewhat plain, although of course beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's not hard to see why she might have been able to successfully hide herself as a male figure, as most women in the 18th century were only about five foot. She also had hazel eyes and a firm, clear voice. It was interesting that in later years it would be noted that when in male uniform, a lot of women fancied Deborah, thinking she was a man, and thought she was quite handsome. And her first attempt at wearing male attire would happen in early 1782. By this point, the American War of Independence had been ongoing for nearly seven years since April 1775. When Europeans had first landed in America, they had created a series of colonies owned by the British, French, Spanish and other European nations. But by the 1760s, Britain dominated the colonies and held them as part of its empire. Settlers in the Americas grew increasingly annoyed by the impositions of the British government that deprived many to their assumed land rights. And this was made worse when taxes were increased, the government expecting the colonies to fund their own defences against the western frontier. After attempting to peacefully settle things with the British government, the colonies split into the Loyalists, who were still loyal to the Crown and identified as British and American, and the Patriots, who now recognised if they wanted to have control over the affairs of their own country, they needed to break away from the motherland. By 1782, both Britain and America were running out of funds, and it was clear that the colonies would have to be given what they asked for, the right to govern themselves amongst other things. But battles were still ongoing, and it was in that year that Deborah would join the military. She certainly wouldn't be the only woman to do this, as Anna Maria Lane had fought alongside her husband since 1776, unknown as a woman to her fellow soldiers, and Margaret Corbin had followed her husband onto the battlefield as a nurse, taking over the cannon when he was killed. But Deborah would, of course, disguise herself as a man and, importantly, enter military ranks completely by herself. She joined the Continental Army in Middleborough under the name Timothy Thayer, dressed in male attire. She collected a small bonus for joining the unit, but then failed to meet up with her company. It turned out she had been recognised by someone local she knew, and she was made to pay the bonus she had not yet spent, but luckily received no further punishment from the army. The First Baptist Church in Middleborough, which Deborah was a member of, heard about her deception. Apparently, she was known for behaviour before this point, which the church considered to be loose and unchristian behaviour. And this could mean anything from sleeping openly with whoever she liked to gambling occasionally or swearing. When they heard about her dressing as a man to join the army, some of the church members apparently tried to talk to her about it, apparently not getting any satisfactory answers, and it was decided they would essentially withdraw fellowship from Deborah, effectively kicking her out of their church. She would never be brought back into their fold, and to be fair, it doesn't appear Deborah was too cut up about it. In May 1782, Deborah enlisted once again, this time making sure she was further away from people she knew going to Uxbridge, Massachusetts to do so, using the name Robert Shirtliff. She joined an elite unit of 50 to 60 men, the Light Infantry Company of the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. The fact she joined an elite unit was crucial to her disguise, as people picked for this unit were more likely to be tall and physically stronger, so it was far less likely anyone would even think about looking for a woman amongst them. On top of this, no one was really bothering with medical checks when someone joined up. As long as they had their front teeth and a working forefinger and thumb, they were allowed in, as this meant they could load up a musket and fire it. Deborah's unit had to provide rapid flank coverage for any advancing regiments, 
as well as protecting other units from behind or going ahead and providing reconnaissance. She would later say she had actually joined up in April 1781 and was present at the capture of British General Charles Cornwallis at the Siege of Yorktown in October of that year. However, there is no evidence Deborah was present at the siege other than her own statement of the fact. It's likely she added this later on when applying for a pension in 1818, possibly worried that she wouldn't be given one unless her story was impressive enough and to give her story the polish of true patriotism. But certainly by July of 1782, Deborah had seen action. She was part of around 30 soldiers from her unit who joined up with some local Patriot militia and was involved in a skirmish near Tarrytown, New York. She fought bravely, but was wounded with a sword slash to the forehead and a gunshot wound in her thigh. When her fellow soldiers discovered her injuries, they wanted to take her to the hospital, but she begged them not to, as she was obviously worried the truth would be discovered. Not wanting their companion to die on their watch, one of the men put her onto his horse and took her for medical treatment immediately. Deborah allowed a doctor to treat her head wound, but she left the hospital before anything else could be done. She then removed the musket ball from her leg herself, using nothing more than a penknife and a sewing needle. However, some of the shot had just gone too deep, and as she was unable to remove it, Deborah's leg never fully healed. As she was injured too badly to continue her duties, she was reassigned to being a waiter for General John Patterson, a major general in the army. While little is known about the details of Deborah's time in those months, as we will see later, she obviously made a good impression. Someone who knew her well and later became a senator was one William Ellis, who later described Deborah of having an uncommon native intellect and force of character. She also had a good understanding of theology, politics and military matters, no doubt the last two contributed by her time in the army and Ellis complimented her style of enthusiastic discussion, remarking that she reminded him of an able diplomat. In short, the little we learn about Deborah seems to paint a picture of a strong, capable woman with a fierce intelligence despite receiving no formal education, someone who probably had a lot to say, but everyone seemed to like her. In July of 1783, Deborah was part of 1,500 soldiers that were ordered by Patterson to go to Philadelphia to quell a protest of some 400 soldiers who were demanding their pay after several delays by the local government. Ironically, on the way to the city, Deborah and the four men she was travelling with were invited to a ball in West Goshen, and she would later remark, how taken she was with the politeness and gentility of everyone there, especially the ladies. We can almost imagine Deborah trying to hide an amused smirk as she invited ladies to dance. But upon reaching the city, Deborah didn't even get involved in any action against the protesting soldiers. Philadelphia that summer was also rife with a highly contagious illness that included fevers and vomiting, and Deborah was struck down with it. She was carried to the local hospital filled with many other soldiers, and she asked to be placed in the loft of the hospital. She was with two other men who both died, leaving her alone with her thoughts. Deborah soon succumbed to the fever and fell unconscious. The physician treating patients at the hospital, Dr. Barnabas Binney, came to check on her at the insistence of the matron to check for signs of life. Of course, this was the moment of discovery. When Dr. Binney went to feel for a heartbeat, he was surprised to find an inner waistcoat, as the cloth Deborah used to bind her breasts would later be described as compressing the soldier's chest. Her female form was revealed, and the doctor wasted no time in taking her to the matron's apartment, where she was cared for by himself, the matron, and Binny's wife and daughters. They were the only people at this point who knew the truth about the soldier they were taking care of, 
and the doctor kindly kept the information to himself for the time being. There was also another slightly awkward event to deal with, although we have no way of knowing how Deborah really felt about it, or in fact, if it really happened. While she was recovering in the matron's apartment, a letter arrived along with a parcel of fruit. It had come from a young lady in Baltimore, who at some point had met and conversed with Deborah, thinking she was chatting away with a young man. The letter expressed how worried the young lady had been at discovering Robert Shirtliff was in hospital and it had made her realise she was in love with him. At first, Deborah didn't know who her mystery admirer was and she sent back a polite reply thanking her mysterious benefactor for the gift and the good wishes without getting into anything more. The interesting part is that Deborah would have an opportunity to meet her mysterious admirer and she didn't actually tell her the truth. When her health was much improved without revealing directly that he knew the truth, Dr. Binney recommended they all take a trip to Baltimore to visit with friends. While there, Deborah received an invitation and deciding to go to the elegant house from which it came, was met by a 17-year-old girl whose name Deborah would not later reveal. The young lady once again expressed her love for Robert and Deborah seems to have decided to go along with it. She stayed for two days, apparently showing reciprocation for her admirer's passions and lots of embracing was to be had. There's obviously little evidence for this story except Deborah's own words, but even that opens up questions. If this really happened, was Deborah's acceptance of the young lady's love showing she really did reciprocate it, or was it just for show, part of her Robert Shirtliff disguise? And if it didn't happen, was Deborah simply trying to create some drama? But then, why not say she gallantly rebuffed the young lady politely? It's a story which, when combined with her penchant for male dress and mannerisms, leaves a lot of questions about Deborah's romantic feelings in an era when there was only one public way of showing romance aloud. But by September 1783, the war was over, the Treaty of Paris was signed, and November 3rd was set for all soldiers to muster out and be disbanded. While the good doctor had never actually told Deborah he knew she was a woman, when he handed her a note to deliver to Patterson on her return, she guessed its contents. She tried to delay the delivery of the letter by a few days, according to one source, but she summoned up her courage and found Patterson alone, dropping the letter off with him and retreating quickly. An hour later, he called her back. She sat down with Patterson, and he apparently asked her if her uniform concealed a woman's body. At those words, he seemed upset he had thought a lot of his soldier turned close staff member and Deborah fainted. When she was roused, she then fell to his feet and begged for her life. Patterson passed her the letter and repeated his question, to which Deborah told him the truth. This does seem a tad dramatic and it's more likely they simply had the dreaded conversation and Deborah admitted she was in fact a female soldier. The truth would have been that she was scared of the repercussions, but Patterson assured her that not only was she safe and respected in his company, but that she would receive compensation for her efforts in the war. After giving her a dress to wear instead of her uniform, she was given a discharge, a note from Patterson with words of advice, and enough money to travel home. Deborah was honourably discharged on the 25th of October 1783 after being a soldier for a year and a half. It is interesting that while she was waiting to be discharged, she was provided with both her uniform and feminine attire and she preferred her soldier's uniform in order to feel safe, not unlike the famous Joan of Arc. And when she returned to Massachusetts to some relatives in a small hamlet, it wasn't as Deborah she approached them, but one of her younger brothers, Ephraim. Deborah wore male clothing once again and assumed the identity of Ephraim Sampson, working her uncle's farm and, according to her first biography, 
flirting with the local farm girls. Again, the question of Deborah's sexual and gender identity seems to be more complicated than a woman simply donning a male outfit in order to serve in the army. At this point, she could have the choice of being female again, and even had she wanted to pretend she wasn't herself for whatever reason, could have pretended to be one of her sisters. It's not out of the question that Deborah was bisexual, especially as this was also the place she met her husband, Benjamin Gannett. There isn't any real evidence of how the pair met, but sometime in the spring of 1784, Deborah started to once again wear feminine clothing. Whether this was her choice or she had been discovered and forced to is unclear. Benjamin was from Sharon, Massachusetts, and after they were married on the 7th of April, 1785, they went to live with his father on the family farm. Life was hard as the farm had been overworked, but they were apparently happy together, and they would go on to have four children, Earl, Mary, Patience, and a little girl named Susanna Baker Shepherd, who they adopted. She was later described as an affectionate parent, and she herself noted that she never used corporal punishment with her children. Deborah said this was down to having seen enough violence as a soldier, and knowing she could instill more discipline in her children by being kind to them. In 1792, probably struggling with money, Deborah petitioned the Massachusetts state legislature for her unpaid military wages. She argued that like any other soldier, she was entitled to the same benefits as a man and she wanted pay that had been withheld from her by the army due to being a woman. The petition was granted and signed off by Governor John Hancock. Deborah was awarded £34 with interest, dating back to her discharge around $5,000 today. It was still a meagre pension to live out the rest of her life on, and she agreed to her first biography in 1797, written by Herman Mann and titled The Female Review, Life of Deborah Sampson, the Female Soldier in the War of Revolution. It helped to make her something of a minor celebrity and probably once again helped with finances. Deborah then attempted, aged about 42, to do a series of lectures between 1802 and 1803. She would begin by extolling the feminine virtues of women and their traditional gender roles, and then disappear off stage and return in her uniform, before performing a complicated military drill and routine. This was not only to earn money for her family, but to justify to critics the choice she had made years before, but it still didn't bring in enough money to pay all the bills. She had to constantly instead borrow money from her family and from friends. She also borrowed from her friend, Paul Revere. Yep, that one. He wrote on her behalf to government officials, arguing that she deserved a pension. Finally, on the 11th of March 1805, the request was granted and Congress approved a meagre pension of $4 a month for Deborah. She would continue to need loans from family and friends over the years and she continued to send letters to Congress asking for adjustments to her pension from the date of her discharge. After being rejected more than once, it was finally agreed in 1816, 11 years after her pension was initially given, that it could be increased to $77 a year. This allowed Deborah and Benjamin to pay off their debts and improve the family farm. But on the 29th of April, 1827, aged 67 years old, Deborah succumbed to yellow fever at her family home. In 1831, once again struggling for money, Benjamin petitioned for a pension as the widower of a veteran, arguing that it was no different to a widow asking for a pension. It was finally granted in 1837, but sadly, he died before he could receive it. In later years, Deborah was memorialised in Sharon. With a statue in front of the library, the farmland around her family home was protected, 
and a bronze plaque and boulder were placed on the town green in Plimpton in Deborah's honour. Her story has also been made into plays and books, some by her own descendants. Ultimately, Deborah sought to extend the limits placed on women by using her ingenuity and skill, and joining the army was merely a vehicle for this. Much of her life was dramatic without added flair, and yet she took hold in the public imagination, her story gaining new additions every time it was told. Deborah herself probably adding quite a few myths in her biography. She pushed what it meant for a woman to be able to do, however, both before and after being a soldier. But best of all, Deborah did all of this while also being a charming and well-liked person, attempting to be the best person she could be, regardless of her clothing, and this would endear others to her allowing her memory to go on many years after her death. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.